So yesterday I showed you some pitfalls that can happen during exploit development and I promised you I will share a full exploit development walkthrough of this uh, small example challenge uh, today. So grab this code from the link below and then use GCC to compile it in this way. And yeah, I guess it's a dangerous function, you shouldn't use it ever. To develop this exploit, it would be fun to have it more look like a real challenge. So I'm using SoCat here, which you can install with apt-get install SoCat. So it will set up a TCP socket and listen on port 1337. Uh, and the other settings are not that important, but you specify an exec, so something that it will execute when somebody connects to that port. Then I'm using SCD buff just to disable the buffering of the in and outputs of that program. Otherwise, um, you wouldn't see like the input and output, uh, doesn't really matter. And then we execute the binary. This means we can use netcat now to connect to this port. Oh, and uh, I guess I accidentally entered a capital A, so I have been blocked and was reported to authorities. So obviously it broke now, but if you don't enter a capital A, the application works and you can enter another input. So just a quick reminder from yesterday's video, there is the buffer overflow caused by the gets which writes data in this limited buffer, but we also have a format string vulnerability here. We can test for format strings by basically entering format characters and see that whenever this data is used and outputted, printed again, if it contains um, weird numbers. So for example, here I'm using percentage %p to basically print the address of something, and you can already see, yep, that output was not simply reflected back. Uh, those percentage %p suddenly became addresses and numbers. And in main, we have a loop around this vulnerable code. So this means in the first loop, we can use the format vulnerability to leak values or addresses from the stack, which we can then use to defeat ASLR. Basically, we just leak some addresses and then we know where the stuff is in memory. And then in the second loop iteration, we then can trigger the buffer overflow, now knowing where our stack is. Now the exploit I'm developing here is pretty lame, but if you are interested in how actual good people are developing exploits and you like to watch that, I really highly recommend to you Zeta2's YouTube channel or Carlos Venson. He's organizing so-called pony races. This is a live event where four people basically race for an exploitation challenge. And you can watch them simultaneously and Zeta2 together with his colleague is um, commenting this whole thing. So it's really, really fascinating to see the approaches they take and who gets further, faster, who finds the bug first and all that kind of stuff. It's really, really interesting and obviously also fun. And recently Zeta2 also asked, uh, how do you name your exploit scripts? <laughs> and then people were saying things like solve.py or x.py amateurs. So I suggest that the superior asd.py or sometimes even asd1.py, asd2.py or asdasd.py depending on how many exploits you are writing that day. So here's my asd.py exploit script that we will be using now. So let's create a socket and connect to localhost. So let's also install the Python extension for Visual Studio Code. So our code connects to the server on localhost and then attempts to receive up to 1024 bytes. So it prints the welcome text. So you know already that we can leak some addresses with percentage %p. But the question is, what actually did we leak here? Where does this point to? So there are basically two things you want to do now. First is a quick idea of what the address is, and then you want to know exactly wh where it points to. So then we want to find the process ID of our process. Now these processes here are related to SOCAT. Uh, this is the actual binary that is running. So this is our PID. Just keep in mind we have executed SOCAT with root, so this process runs as root. So that's why we need sudo if we want to access the proc file system of this process. And specifically we want to access maps to get the memory map. Now the first address that we leak is in 7FF75. So let me just copy this here over there. So now we have it here at the bottom. So the first address here. Now the first address seems to point into libc. So if you would want to leak an address of libc to basically defeat ASLR of libc, so you know where it is in memory, then the first address you could use that. But we look for a stack address. So the next value here is 7FFE4. So yeah, the next address lays between this start and end address. So yes, this address here is from the stack. Now that we know the process ID, we can also attach GDB to it. And then we can specifically look at that address. So I'm examining 
uh, GX. G stands for giant, I believe. That's the output formatter for 64-bit, and then we want it in hex. Okay, so there is no value there at all. We can also print a bit more, but uh, we don't find anything recognizable. So it points somewhere on the stack. It definitely helps you to basically defeat ASLR and you will be able to find where the stack is in memory, but it is like not a super convenient value. It doesn't seem to point to anything useful for us. So this address has a certain meaning and we wanna figure out what that meaning is. Now, it could be a good idea to always look at these things in a certain context. Now, we attach to this program now at some point in time after we have done some input or so, and we could now investigate the memory. But memory changes during the execution of the program. So it makes sense to think about the context you want to be in when you are investigating the memory. And so generally a good idea is to kind of look at the state of the memory and the state of the stack and all that stuff doing your investigation at very critical points in time. And this could, for example, be at the return before the buffer overflow. Basically, you want to know how does the memory look like before I get to my shell code. Or it could, for example, be just before or after triggering the format string vulnerability because there maybe these values have meaning. Um, so let's set the breakpoint at one of them. I guess we can set the breakpoint at the return where we would trigger the buffer overflow uh, just because uh, we need that later anyway. So here, disassemble main. So here we see the vulnerable printf. We could break here or we could uh, break at the return. It's not like there's much happening after this printf and that return, but it's still important that this is kind of the context we want to look at those values. So let's set a breakpoint at the return. Now we enter again our leak. Now this is also kind of interesting. We could quickly compare, oh yeah, the values are still the same. So uh, we know there are no weird side effects or so. And so now we hit the return. Let's investigate where this address points to. So now looking at this memory, there's all zeros. I don't know, there's some random data down here. To be honest, not quite sure where it points to. But we also know that we should have data on the stack because of the buffer overflow. Uh, and I don't see this data here yet, but it's also difficult to see our data. So maybe let's add a couple of recognizable characters to our input. So let's continue. Let's do like XXXX. Then we leak our output and uh, a couple of Ys. Ah, interesting. See, now the second value changed. And look here. This, this is, uh, this, these are our x. So it leaked our x's here. So you can see that the length of the input seems to influence uh, what some of these values are. So let's check out where it points now to. Uh, we still can't see here anything, but maybe let's go a little bit uh, back up and see uh, what was before it. And look at that. And look at that, we see our input. Uh, these are our y's. And, and look where the 2, 3, b is. So this address that we are leaking seems to point at the end of our input. So let's test our theory. So let's use a three percentage P with a comma separated. So that should be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight characters. Now this leaked address should point at the end of that input string. So again, at this address it's just zero, but now let's go back eight bytes. And here it is. If you actually print this as a string, examine string, you can see that it indeed points at almost at the start. Uh, I forgot the null byte at the end. So actually, we have to subtract 9. And 9 is the start of our string. So now we can use this string as a leak and subtract 9 from it to find the start. So we sent that input and don't forget the new line. We need to send, you know, that we pressed enter the new line. And then we try to receive the response. Just FYI, sometimes the receive is too fast here and the server didn't actually send you the output yet. yet. In these kind of cases, you just need to build the loop and basically program yourself a little read until, so you keep receiving until you receive what you need. So let's try it out. There we go. We get our leak output and we get asked to enter the next payload. So let's extract that value here. By the way, I'm using here Python 2 just because uh, doing this kind of uh, exploit development is a little bit nicer in Python 2. Python 3 is a little bit annoying with the uh, byte ASCII string conversion stuff. So we can split the response at the commas. Oh, see here, I executed it once and we didn't read fast enough. And on the second try, we it worked. So maybe uh, let's add here a quick loop. So here, just a quick while loop. It's not a good solution. Uh, it's, it's still kind of ugly, but basically we say, please keep receiving until R 
contains a comma. And this is also why I deliberately used commas here because I can easily then recognize them again at the output and we can easily split uh, the string there. So I was just thinking a step ahead when, when I was planning my, my format string. So now that means the second value is our leak. So the second element is a string obviously, so we can convert it to an integer. We can use int and we say six, the base is 16, so it's a hex number. Awesome, now we have an integer. Now from that integer, we can subtract nine. Now we have the start of our buffer. And then we can also add here like this cool output that we leaked like the start of a buffer. Excellent. So now we finished the leak. Now we want to focus on our buffer overflow and we still have to figure out uh, how much padding do we need until we overwrite the return point on the stack. To do that, you can generate uh, a unique pattern, a non-repeating like unique uh, pattern. And you can, there are some tools to do this, but you know, I'm such a pro that I can just generate my own pattern. So let's copy our amazing generated pattern and we can copy it in our test from earlier. Okay, so output seemed to have stopped and now we received the segmentation fault. Okay, so we basically have seen this before. Let's do the standard test that you should be doing. Okay, we crashed here. So what was this instruction? This was the return. Okay, so we should look at the stack. Oh, this looks like values we have overwritten. Okay, so we do have above overflow here. So we, now we want to know the offset. Now I'm printing at RSP here the string. So the return tried to pop this value from the stack and then uh, set RIP to it. And that's where the sec fault was triggered. This means also the first eight characters here are the uh, return pointer on the stack. So these values here are the first eight here. Let's just copy a couple of these bytes. We go in here, we search for it. Perfect, we find it here. Remove all the rest at the end. And so now how long is this? Uh, you actually don't see it. Unfortunately, it's like, it's like right right there in that blue bar here, right there, it says 264 selected. I'm just calling this the padding. Now let's create a payload. So the super standard payload for these kind of uh, basic exploitation challenges is always you have the padding to fill up the buffer until you have the uh, return pointer on the stack. Then I'm using here a variable RIP. Uh, this is where we can set RIP to plus and then for example, some shellcode. And basically we want to set RIP to point into our shellcode. So we need the variable RIP. So RIP, we have to set it to the shellcode here. RIP is definitely at the start of the buffer. The address that we leaked and then calculated with the minus nine offset points at the start of our buffer. So this basically points here at padding. This means if we want to point this address now to the shellcode, we uh, can simply add the length of the padding. Now it should point here basically where RIP starts itself. And then we move it eight forward to compensate for RIP itself. And now we should be at the shellcode. And now just a test shellcode before we get real shellcode. I'm just uh, sending 64 CCs. This was also covered in a previous Hexember episode, uh, which is also now part of the uh, binary exploitation playlist. This is the opcode for breakpoints. So uh, we should, you know, uh, see, see what that does. And then we simply send this. All right. Now, another small debugging tip. And it's always good to test these things while you are attached to the process with GDB. But the problem is right now, you know, uh, we can't like just simply launch GDB because uh, we use this network thing with SOCAT. So we need to figure out the process ID um, of whatever SOCAT is spawning. And so that we can attach with GDB then to this process and then run our exploit. So a simple tip is just to basically pause your exploit script. So I'm using here raw input, which then basically waits for somebody to uh, provide input to this Python script, basically hitting enter. And only then it starts uh, the, the exploit process. Actually, let's put it uh, after the leak so we can see that the leak was successful. All right, let's run it. Okay, so we leaked the buffer and now we asked, do we wanna exploit it? Now we have all the time in the world to check for the process. Again, these are the SOCAT processes. This is the one we are interested in. PID of CAF would also give you the correct one. Now you might have multiple attempts at trying this out. So maybe you wanna do like GDB uh, PID of CAF and we need sudo. All right, so let's hit continue. And now let's trigger the exploit. Ah, fuck, I'm an idiot. Okay, so this is an integer, uh, RIP. I completely forgot that now we need to convert this integer 
uh, to a raw byte string that we can then send over. For that, of course, of course I'm using Python struct again. And please check out uh, here the format characters that exist. In a lot of the older videos that were 32-bit binary, we were using capital I for this conversion. But that is defined to have the size of four bytes because that's a 32-bit integer. But instead of 32-bit, uh, we now have 64-bit uh, addresses. So we need eight bytes. And so in this case, we want to use here something that has eight bytes. And here is an unsigned version of that. So it's capital Q. So we pack this integer here into a 64-bit or 8-byte uh, raw byte string. Let's try this again. We execute this. It's attached to it again. There we go. We continue. Now, I don't know what it did. We can look here. Yeah. Look at this. We triggered a breakpoint trap. Sick trap. You know what this means? This means this exploit worked first try. We chose the correct address to overwrite the return pointer on the stack. And we were successfully pointing it to the start of our shellcode where we have placed the CCCC, um, which, is, which triggered uh, this output here. We can look here at RIP and you can see here our CCC outputs. So perfect, now we can place there just our shellcode and we should get a shell, right? So I'm going here just on shellstorm. So let's look for Linux 64-bit. Uh, there we go. And we want something like bin sh or so. Let's have a look at this one here. Uh, looks good. So this should just execute bin sh. So uh, there we go. We commented out our previous test shellcode and replaced it with our new shellcode. And then I've also added this snippet here, which I think I've used before in some CTF write-ups. And I think I've even mentioned where I got this from. I learned this trick from uh, GeoHot Live CTF way before I even started my channel. Basically, the videos that motivated me to start my channel. Anyway, uh, you basically use the talent lib to create an interactive shell. Long story short, uh, when you are able to spawn, for example, a shell, you can then keep still interacting with the socket by using your keyboard. Anyway, uh, let's execute this. Anyway, let's execute this. The start of buffer. Uh, we get some weird output. Let's see if it worked. And we are root. So our shell code got executed. First try, no debugging whatsoever, bam. Anyway, uh, now I need to do the change uh, for the pitfall that I mentioned uh, in the yesterday's video. So in this case, I want to place the shellcode right before the RIP. And now we need to uh, obviously account for the length of the shellcode and we need to uh, remove this. So we can simply use this comprehension here. So we start uh, from the start of the padding until and now from the back, we subtract the length of the shellcode. And now uh, the padding should still be fine and we should still hit uh, RIP. For test purposes, to make it easier, let me also add a CC at the start of the payload. This should help us uh, testing it. And then we should also recalculate RIP because we are not pointing here after RIP anymore. Now we need to point here at the start of our shellcode, which means we need to also subtract again 8 for the RIP and then subtract for the shellcode. So Let's move this down here. And just to visualize, I keep the whole calculation. So this right now points after RIP. This means if we want to point here at the start of the shellcode, we subtract 8. Now we are before the RIP. And now we subtract the length of shellcode. And we should be at the start of our shellcode. All right. And, and then let's run it. So now it's asking uh, for our input. Basically, it wants to hit us Enter. Now we have time to attach to the process. Let's hope this works. We got a sick trap, trace breakpoint. This means it executed the CC at the start of our uh, shellcode. So let's have a quick uh, look at that. Let's step slowly forward and see if our uh, shellcode works. Segmentation fault? All right. And now we basically come to the part that you have seen yesterday, where this was the setup for the weird pitfall that you find yourself in. And then you need to debug it and, f and figure it out. So if you haven't seen uh, yesterday's video, uh, check that out.